So there's been a few changes to the last session. Uh, so one uh, person uh, in uh, Alberstam wasn't able to come here today. Jerome Cocker had to go back to Parliament where he's actually working on the Canadian government. Canada maybe one of the first countries to pass the legislation that we're hearing more about uh, dealing with issues of excitement. So Cocker went back to Ottawa to deal with that. So he's not going to be here. So the way the session will, will work, um, we're going to have Gregory Gordon speak. His, the title of his paper is From Incitement to Indictment, Prosecuting uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad for a Advocating Israel's Destruction. It's a very important uh, topic and one that the Yale Initiative and members of our academic community have been very much engaged in. Uh, and I actually wrote a, a piece with Erwin Kostler uh, on incitement and actually presented it at the OCE and, and in the Bundestag. Uh, Professor Nash and I are actually just in the House of Commons and the House of Lords of the United Kingdom dealing with, with this issue as well. So I think it's a very important issue and cuts to one of the main concerns of uh, a research center dealing with anti Semitism. So once Professor Gordon has finished, uh, David Benashri, who's the director of the Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University, will sort of make some uh, summing up, uh, ending keynote talk about the issues that we discussed uh, last night and tonight, and perhaps ways to, uh, to have maybe an action or something come out of this, uh, this event. So it's really a, a pleasure to be able to introduce Gregory Gordon. He's a professor of law at the University of North Dakota and is one of the leading legal scholars on those very issues. sense of the scope of my discussion. Um, I think he gave you a good overview of the law and some of the issues that are involved. What I propose to do is to break things down a little bit more and analyze um, the potential uh, liability of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad for um, incitement crimes. Um, and I'm going to focus on what would be a criminal trial. Could he actually be brought to justice uh, on criminal charges for his uh, incendiary statements regarding Israel and Israeli Jews. Um, so that's going to be the focus of my talk, and I'm going to look and I'm going to break down um, the issues. Now, of course, where all this furor began was his statement on October 25, 2005, that um, Israel must be wiped off the face of the map at the World Without Zionism Conference which was one of the early significant uh, moments in his presidency. And people have focused on that statement a lot. Um, and I want to begin by saying that part of what I'd like to do today is dispel the notion that if Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is liable for incitement crimes, that it's limited to this statement. That, to me, is a mistake to think. Of. It, is, it is not this statement alone, because frankly, if it were just this statement, I wouldn't be standing up here. And there, I don't think we, we would, I mean, we might have a discussion related to other issues, but it wouldn't be criminal prosecution. So let's, let's kind of just explore a little bit what issues come up as a result of the idea of a potential criminal prosecution of the Iranian president. First of all, does the developing body of incitement law, uh, which has really taken on a, a life of its own through the Rwandan genocide prosecutions, does it permit prosecution of a sitting head of state whose words actually defy easy translation and whose audience appears amorphous? So we're going to look, of course, at what the words are and what the audience might be. Secondly, even if it does, would prosecution run afoul of the law in the absence of actual rather than threatened mass atrocity? If we don't have an actual genocide, can we successfully bring a prosecution for incitement to genocide? Third, may a politician face crimes against humanity charges when he has supported attacks 
by a third party client against civilians he is threatening in his speeches, but has not perpetrated the attacks himself directly. Okay, because that is an issue that we have, and, and one of the things that I'd like to point out right now is that, frankly, I, I think one of the contributions that I've been able to make in this discussion is I think I've been the first person to propose that uh, Ahmadinejad would be liable for crimes against humanity. There have been scholars talking about incitement to genocide, but not crimes against humanity. And I'll explain why I think that's in play in a moment. And then finally, uh, of course, and this is really uh, a salient issue in the United States, um, is there nevertheless a risk that any such criminal charges could impermissibly <coughs> infringe on hallowed free expression rights? Um, and of course here in the United States with our First Amendment and the way that we cherish free speech, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. So I will cover those issues um, in the course of my talk. What I, the roadmap where I propose to go is I'm going to briefly look at, in my paper, I, I have a paper out that's coming out on this. It's going to be in uh, volume 98 of the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology from Northwestern University, <coughs> uh, volume 98, number three. Um, it should be out in June. And in my paper, I talk about, a little bit about the history of Iran and the rise of Ahmadinejad. I try to situate, because a lot of incitement law deals with context. And it's important to understand the context of the statements that are being made by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Secondly, I break down the statements themselves. Of course, notice that, that, that this is a plural. This is not a singular statement. It's not just the October 25th statement. It's important to understand that there is a body of statements. Third, I look at the legal framework, current legal framework that I mentioned a moment ago. And then within that framework, I consider the viability of prosecution. And then finally, um, Given what I will say is, I think, uh, a very little likelihood of actual prosecution, I want to talk about some policy considerations that rise from that. Um, we've heard a lot of good um, information today about Iran and its history and, and, and its development, um, starting as, uh, for, from its dynastic history, uh, Muslim conquest, and then we've heard about the, the period of, of, of the Shahs, um, leading, of course, to the Islamic Revolution, which is where our point of focus really begins. Ahmadinejad, of course, is really a product of that Islamic revolution. Um, he himself has been a devout Muslim from youth. Um, his name was originally Saborgian, uh, but was changed to Ahmadinejad, which means uh, of the, the, the faith of, of Muhammad, I, I think, or, or, or something along those lines. I, I don't speak Farsi, but um, within his name, there is uh, already a strong link to Islam. Um, and he became, of course, a, a committed Islamic revolutionary activist. Um, and some believe, but uh, it has not been proved conclusively, of course, that he might have actually been one of those involved in the taking of hostages um, when uh, the Americans were taken in uh, 1979. Um, he was, despite that, uh, relatively unknown in Iranian politics until he became mayor of Tehran um, he began to institute uh, fairly extremist policies as mayor of Tehran, um, and then he was a surprise uh, victor in the uh, race for president of Iran in 2005. And that is, of course, when he was catapulted into world prominence, especially once he delivered his infamous remarks on October 25th. Um, from the beginning, he started spouting uh, extremist rhetoric. Uh, this is just an example. Thanks to the blood of the martyrs, a new Islamic revolution has arisen that will cut off the roots of injustice in, in the world. So this notion of someone who is messianic or sees himself as messianic and sees his administration as a chance to usher in a new era of, of justice is, I think, important to understanding the context of the presidency of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Of course, another one of the prominent features of his presidency has been the support of terrorist groups aiming to destroy Israel. Um, Hezbollah has been uh, perhaps the uh, most infamous of these relationships, especially in relation to its 2006 attack in summer uh, against Israel. Um, but there's also been support of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. In fact, um, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice has referred to Iran as a central banker 
of terrorism in the world. As Professor Kotler pointed out last night, there had been missile, there have been parades where there had been missiles that had been draped in um, banners. I, I'm not uh, actually um, tr uh, purporting to, to show specifically one of those banners, and because I don't read the language, I don't know. But I just this is an example of, of something that came by in a parade, and I'm just showing it as a, as a visual. So I make that qualification. But there have been um, accounts of these missiles draped, and there are photographs. I just don't have in this PowerPoint presentation saying the equivalent of death to Israel. Um, so where there may be some dispute about Ahmadinejad's statements, especially his October 25th statement about wiping Israel off the map, this sort of image is extremely valuable, I think, in understanding the mindset, especially when we talk about the intent, which we will when, when, when we talk about genocide of Ahmadinejad in making these statements. The other thing that we need to keep in mind to put all this into context is that Iran, of course, is trying to develop a nuclear capacity. And while this may seem dire to some, certain experts believe that Iran could be capable of building nuclear weapons as early as 2009. Um, there has, of course, been the national intelligence estimate, which has called this into question. Um, I would say, however, that if you look at the literature that's come out since the National Intelligence Estimate, it's not so clear that the National Intelligence Estimate got it right. That, in fact, it looks like Iran has uh, developed what it needs uh, to uh, create nuclear weapons, especially the fissile material that's necessary for that. Um, it's much easier to create uh, or develop a warhead um, than it is to, to have the fissile material, and apparently they are continuing to develop the fissile material. Um, and it, it does seem odd, and I think people can maybe disagree about this, but it does seem odd that Iran is so desperate to have nuclear energy for civilian purposes only. Um, it just seems like there, there could be other, other energy sources. Uh, the fact that it's clandestine, uh, the fact that the, the, parade, uh, the, the missiles have been paraded and have been developed, those Shahab-3 missiles, which are capable of hitting Tel Aviv that Iran possesses, makes us think that perhaps it's motives in developing uh, a nuclear are, are less than peaceful. Um, there have, of course, been the two Security Council resolutions, um, 1737 of December 2006 and 1747 of March 2007, which have called on Iran uh, to end its nuclear program, and Iran has thumbed its nose at those. And there was talk of another uh, resolution uh, coming out uh, soon. Now. Against this ominous backdrop, Ahmadinejad has made a number of incendiary statements related to Israel, and I have broken them down by category. Uh, the most serious, of course, are the calls for destruction. Um, those are fairly direct. But there are more indirect uh, statements that have been made, which, in my opinion, also uh, can be classified as part of the incitement to genocide. Predictions of Israel's destruction being one of them. Dehumanization of Israeli Jews. Um, accusing Israel of perpetrating mass murder. Condoning past violence against Israel. Advocating expulsion of Israeli Jews from the Middle East. Um, and, of course, uh, a topic that we've talked about at great length today, Holocaust denial. Let's just take quickly a look at each kind of statement. In addition to the 2005, the October 25, 2005, wipe off the map speech, he has stated that the Zionist regime cannot survive and cannot continue its existence. On August 4, 2006, during the Israel Hezbollah military conflict, he stated that the real cure for the Lebanon conflict is elimination of the Zionist regime. In February 2008, so quite recently, he told Le Mans that, quote, these false people, Israeli Jews, these fabricated people, cannot continue to exist. He has also made predictions of destruction. And I would submit there's been a recent paper put out by Susan Vanish at Georgetown that these different categories are part of incitement to genocide. You don't just have to say, kill the Israelis. You can say other things that indicate that that's what you want. Predicting that they should be destroyed, for example, is one of them. On April 14, 2006, 
Uh, for example, he stated the Zionist regime is heading toward annihilation and elimination. As recently as January 2008, uh, he indicated to a television audience that Israel was doomed. And by the way, these are just a sample. There are many others, um, and I make reference to them in my paper. He has also uh, dehumanized Israeli Jews. Uh, on August 1st, 2006, he stated, quote, they are like cattle, nay, more misguided, a bunch of bloodthirsty barbarians. Next to them, all the criminals of the world seem righteous. And again, in February 2008, he variously described Israel to supporters at a rally as a, quote, filthy bacteria, a wild beast and scarecrow. Especially when, when you hear things like filthy bacteria, it, it seems to harken back to Nazi propaganda against the Jews um, in the 1930s. He has also accused Jews, this is another technique of incitement uh, called accusation in a mirror where you accuse the, the people that you are, are trying to attack of the very thing that you want to do to them, and it's a lie. Uh, in December uh, 2005, he noted that Israeli Jews have been allowing themselves to kill the Palestinian people, for example. And on October 5, 2007, uh, he noted that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians. He has condoned past violence against Israel in October 2005, telling an audience that there is no doubt that the new wave of attacks in Palestine will erase the stain of Israel from the face of Islam. And he's even gone so far as to threaten supporters of Israel, saying again in October 2005, anybody who recognizes Israel will burn in the fire of the Islamic nation's purity. He has called for expulsion of Israeli Jews from Israel. Um, in December 14, 2005, he asked that Israeli Jews be removed to Europe, the United States, Canada, or Alaska. He repeated a similar call in October 2007, uh, urging that Israeli Jews be removed to Alaska. And of course, there is the Holocaust denial, um, and most prominently sponsoring and speaking at the December 2006 conference uh, review of the Holocaust Global Vision, where David Duke, the Ku Klux Klan, member attended, as, as did Robert Foisson, uh, the prominent uh, Holocaust denier. I told somebody I had one cartoon in this presentation, and this is it. This, obviously, the site of genocide is not a very uh, you know, laughable subject, but you know, we have to have a little bit of levity in here. So what, what kind of crimes are we talking about here um, if we look at these statements? What we can consider is, first of all, direct and public incitement to commit genocide. And the source of this crime is the Genocide Convention of 1948, um, in particular Article 3. The Article 2 actually sets out the definition of genocide, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, which is a series of acts um, uh, committed with the intent to destroy a whole or in part an ethnic, racial, religious group as such, um, national as well. Um, but then the tradition of the Genocide Convention, of course, has been carried down into the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, um, which essentially takes Articles 2 and 3 of the Genocide Convention and places them into Articles 6 and 25. And then what are called Universal Jurisdiction Statutes, which are domestic uh, legislation um, which allows uh, any municipal court to prosecute, for example, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, what we call use Kogan's crimes. That's, that's the other way we can, we can look at it. The other crime that we can look at, of course, is crimes against humanity, and, and in particular, persecution. There are a number of crimes against humanity. Um, persecution is the one that applies best to Ahmadinejad's speeches. Um, and again, we look at the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, Article 7H, and Universal Jurisdiction Statutes. There is no convention, there is no treaty for crimes against humanity, and that's one of the sad realities of uh, the post-World War, World War II uh, era. More specifically, we get guidance on how to interpret these sources from the Rwandan incitement cases. Professor Kotler mentioned them um, last night. Uh, Akiyezu, John Paul Akiyezu was the first. He was the Bourgmest, um in Kaba, which is a, a small town in Belgium. It's not so much that his case was significant in terms of how many were killed, Certainly thousands were in and around that area. He had his hand in a lot of it. Um, he was just a mayor 
Um, it's the fact that it was the first case. It was the first case that was uh, tried and brought to a judgment in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And so it was the first case of genocide that was adjudicated since the Genocide Convention. And so it set an important precedent and gave us a lot of the important elements. Uh, as Professor Cotler mentioned, uh, it gave us a sense of what is public. When we talk about direct and public incitement to genocide, um, what is direct? Um, and um, there we understand that direct deals with the context, the cultural and linguistic context of the place and time that the yes. statement was made. Kambanda, uh, Jean Kambanda was the prime minister, and he spoke in metaphors. Uh, for example, as we heard last night, drinking dog's blood, um, uh, allowing the uh, Hutus to have their, their blood drunk like dogs uh, without retaliating. That was a call to incitement. Uh, as found by the tribunal. Uh, it also uh, let us know that a state leader, because he was the prime minister and he was the first head of government to be found guilty of genocide. Uh, Rougiou, uh, Georges Rougiou, um, I was a prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and I actually drafted that indictment, or at least I, I, I helped draft it. Um, he was the only non-black African, he was a European, a Belgian, uh, who got on uh, the radio, Radio Televisión Libre de Nicolín, the famous RTLM, and incited to genocide. He too used euphemisms, such as finishing off the revolution of 1959, which was a reference to a time when there were massive ethnic massacres against Tutsis by Hutu in the, 19, in the late 1950s. And then, of course, the famous media case, um, which is the prosecutor versus Nahimana, Barre, Guiza, and Ngezi. Um, these are three media executives. Um, Nahimana and Barre Guiza were the founders of RTLM. Ngezi was the editor in chief of Kangura, the newspaper, the chief newspaper that was calling for the extermination of Tutsis around the time of the Rwanda genocide. Um, that case gave us a very good indication of what constitutes illegal incitement versus what constitutes legitimate speech. Um, and then uh, Mugacera was the Canadian case. Uh, Leon Mugacera gave an infamous speech in November of 1993 in which essentially he told Tutsis that they need to be sent back to their homeland of Ethiopia uh, via the Nyabarongo River, which is a non-navigable river that was traditionally used to dispose of corpses after large-scale ethnic massacres. The first issue that we have to consider here is whether or not Ahmadinejad has general genocidal intent. As I mentioned, genocide consists of certain harmful acts, killing, causing serious bodily and mental harm, inflicting on a group conditions calculated to bring about its physical destruction, for example, committed with the, the intent to destroy in whole or in part a, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. Okay, that's our basic definition of genocide. There is an issue that comes up on the general intent part of it, which is, does Ahmadinejad have intent to kill Jews when 25, or approximately 25,000 uh, Jews live in his country, and he has not targeted them for destruction, per se? Um, I would argue that he is, um, that he does have intent to commit genocide, even though he may not want to kill every single Jew that exists in the world. If he wants to kill Israeli Jews, if he wants to destroy Israeli Jews, that that is enough. Uh, we learned from the International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia jurisprudence uh, coming out of the Srebrenica cases that where only a certain number of Muslims were targeted for murder, intent to destroy a group within a specific area, in that case, that enclave around Srebrenica, uh, is enough, is sufficient to establish genocidal intent, even though it's not all of the Bosnian Muslims. The same would apply to Israeli Jews. And then, beyond the general in, in, intent issue, there are the elements of incitement. And as I mentioned, we get those from the Akiyezu and the Nahimana cases. It has to be direct, um, of course, it has to be public. Uh, but when we talk about direct, it, again, it has to be viewed in light of its cultural and linguistic content. The question we need to ask is, did the people for whom the message was delivered, or for whom it was intended, um, immediately grasp the implications thereof? 
And then, of course, as I say, the Namimana case was so helpful in fleshing out the content of the speech, whether it was permissible speech or whether it had corroded into criminal incitement. And to do that, we looked at its purpose, its text, its context, um, and there's a relation really between, I think, context and whether or not it's direct. And the relationship between the speaker and subject or the speaker and the audience. Um, and uh, then we looked at uh, mens rea um, and causation. And again, the general genocidal intent will inform to large, a large extent what we think about whether or not there is incitement. Um, again, the direct element in light of its cultural and linguistic content, did the person for whom the message was intended immediately grasp the implication thereof? And there are some issues that come up when we look at, the, at directness. First of all, if we just look at the wipe off the map speech. Now, I, I mentioned that I didn't think the wipe off the map, map speech in and of itself is enough to, to be the basis for prosecution of incitement to genocide. That said, I look at it as an extremely important anchor around which the other statements can be placed, and which, as an ensemble, can be the basis of incitement charges. So we do have to ask ourselves some serious questions about that speech. First of all, do we have a good translation of the Farsi? And there's been a lot of controversy about exactly what was said in Farsi. For example, did Ahmadinejad talk about uh, a map, wiping Israel off the map, or eliminating it from the page, pages of time? We heard reference uh, to the imam, you know, as the imam said. Uh, what, what is that? What is the significance of that? Um, did he talk about it being wiped off, or did he talk about it collapsing? Was he talking about the regime, the, the, the specific government of Israel, or was he talking about the people of Israel? And there has been, a, uh, uh, there's been an analogy made to Khrushchev's famous, we will bury you speech. Uh, which was delivered at the height of the Cold War. Um, and if you look at Khrushchev's comments, he made them in the context of other statements, and they seem a little more innocuous, uh, but they were used for propaganda purposes to make it seem as though the Soviet Union was, you know, would be attacking us imminently. There are responses to these issues. First of all, it's interesting to note that all official Iranian translations refer to wiping Israel away. And there are linguists, as I point out in my paper, who subscribe to that view as well. Um, Iranian experts, uh, there's certainly many of them who believe that map is actually a more accurate translation than the pages of time. Um, and whether or not Ahmadinejad is talking about the regime or the entire country and its people, um, he does refer to it often as an occupying regime. And there is certainly a level of hatred that seems to indicate that he's referring uh, to the people and not just the government. Um, the other thing is, we have to consider the statement within the larger context of the other statements that were made. Again, it's not like the statement was made in isolation. If we look at the other statements, there's reason to believe that he would say that Israel should be wiped off from that. And of course, there are numerous other statements by Ahmadinejad that are not subject to translation controversies. So there's a lot, I think, that a prosecutor could hang her hat on in prosecuting Ahmadinejad. Another directness issue is um, the fact that in the Rwandan cases, statements made in the context of violence against the target group were a prominent feature of the cases. Without the contextual violence, perhaps you don't have the directness. And I, that's an argument that I've heard made. Um, but my counter would be is that you have had a context of violence by proxy. Because Iran has used terrorists to do a lot of its dirty work for it and has attacked civilians um, through uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad. Another directness issue is what is the target of the incitement? And I mentioned this a moment ago. Is it the Zionist government, not Israelis themselves? And I think, in addition to what I said about the October 25th statement in and of itself, if we look at the whole body of statements, um, I think that we can conclude that they're actually anti-Semitic. They are not just about the government. Uh, first of all, I would submit that anti-Zionism is a proxy for anti-Semitism. And in my paper, uh, I have, a, a, I think, a fairly compelling quote from Yehuda Bauer uh, about that and some other experts. Um, secondly, I think if you look at the Holocaust denial, that that's of a piece 
with the hatred that goes towards the Jewish people, um, for the reasons I think that, that Meyer pointed out. And then I would point to a, a very insightful statement by Professor William Shavis, who was perhaps the foremost expert on genocide in the world, that, quote, the history of genocide shows that those who incite the crime speak in euphemisms. And I would submit that Ahmadinejad can't have it both ways. He can't pretend like he's just a court jester making ridiculous statements that nobody is going to take seriously. He is making these statements in a context that suggests that he is serious about what he's doing. And he's not going to be able to hide behind that court jester persona. The other uh, issue is, who is the, the audience for his insight? What is the intended audience? Is it Iranians? Okay. If it is, then our analysis has to shift to, to a certain extent. Is it Islamists, Islamic extremists? Or is it Muslims in general? To understand whether it is immediately grasped, whether his message or the significance of it is immediately grasped, we need to know who the audience is. And that's something that would have to be worked out if this case were ever brought to trial. Um, this would be a, certainly a, a, a trial issue. What about, the other thing is, what is the incitement urging um, listeners to do? An argument would go, assuming the statements are directed at Iranians, why would Ahmadinejad have to incite when he and or the, the ruling elite in Iran uh, would themselves uh, control the use of nuclear weapons, would themselves push the nuclear button? And I think the counter to this is that Iranians have expressed dissent against Ahmadinejad's policies. Uh, there was a big protest uh, last summer, for example. Um, and I think what he's trying to do, I think an argument could be made, is he's trying to generate consent for a policy that would clearly result in mass murder if nuclear weapons were, were used, and would likely lead to a war that Iranians would have to fight. And I think he's trying to create an environment of hatred toward Israel and Israeli Jews that would allow there to be consensus. The other thing is that we're, we're now just talking about killing. We're talking about destruction. The other aspect of this is he has called for the, the forced expulsion of Israeli Jews from the Middle East. And we could argue that one of those acts that I referred to, um, uh, advocating infliction of serious bodily and mental harm, that that is another uh, potential um, part of incitement to genocide. This is another, remember, there are a series of acts. Forced expulsion could be one of them. Um, it's not limited to murder. So um, there's another possibility for, for arguing that he's committed incitement to genocide without getting into whether or not he wants to kill Israeli Jews, etc. The causation element um, is something that I think is going to be brought up in any potential prosecution of Ahmadinejad because there has never been an incitement case brought in the absence of an actual genocide. But it's important to note that the jurisprudence says it's not required. It is not required. This is an inchoate crime. The crime is committed when the, or when the words are uttered in the proper context and with the elements that I mentioned earlier. The other crime that we can consider, of course, is crimes against humanity. Was Ahmadinejad's advocacy part of a widespread, this is in the legal, the legal jargon, a widespread and systematic attack directed against any civilian <coughs> population made with knowledge of the attack? Professor Kotler made reference to the Stryker case from Nuremberg. That case, along with Rougiou, uh, who I mentioned a moment ago, that was the, the European, Belgian uh, radio announcer, Nahimana and Mugusera, the Canadian case, clearly indicate that it is not necessary to show resultant violence when it comes to crimes against humanity. The words themselves are persecution. That's the crime, persecution, deprivation of a fundamental right. There are a couple issues that come up, though, uh, with this uh, crime. Um, the first is, is the link to terrorist attacks. If you're going to show that there were widespread and systematic attacks, it's going to have to be through the terrorist acts that were committed by proxy through Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. Um, but there is credible evidence that Ahmad, Ahmadinejad has financed and supported these groups that have attacked Israel. And it's interesting to note that some of his speeches advocating destruction of Israel were made during the summer 2006 attack on Israeli civilians by Hezbollah. So you can link 
those statements to the actual violence. And that makes a more compelling case for crimes against humanity. Um, I, I mentioned in here the Nicaragua case dealing with effective control. That would be an issue. How much control did Iran have? That would be a trial issue. Um, but realize that the ICTY case of prosecutor versus Tadich supported a, a, a test of lesser control than Nicaragua versus the United States, which is from the International Court of Justice. The other thing that I think people are going to point out is that there's this decision from the ICTY, the Portage decision, um, which states that there, which indicates that there does need to be uh, resulting violence if there's going to be a, a successful charge of persecution. Um, I would note that it does it inaccurately cites the Stryker case. It ignores Ruju, which had come out and uh, from the ICTR and said the opposite. And if you read it, it's not particularly well reasoned. The Fritcha decision from Nuremberg, Fritcha, who was the head of radio um, under Goebbels' propaganda ministry, he was acquitted. And I, uh, I'm actually planning to write an article about that case. But that was at odds with the Stryker and the Otto Dietrich case. Dietrich was in the propaganda ministry as well, and he was convicted in subsequent Nuremberg trials. And that is also a poorly reasoned decision. Finally, this issue of free speech. Um, what a crimes against humanity charge uh, impermissibly infringe on, on free speech rights. Uh, the U.S. First Amendment, of course, has the Brandenburg Standard, um, which will, the First Amendment will not protect speech that is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to produce such, such action. Um, we do have a more attenuated nexus between violence against civilians and hate speech here, but it's arguable that even under the Brandenburg Standard, uh, there would still be a valid claim. Remember, we are not in the United States, and so there is a much looser international standard. Finally, there have been suggested jurisdictions for uh, where Ahmadinejad can be prosecuted. The International Court of Justice uh, could take the case pursuant to Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, which is the so-called Compromissory Clause. Um, but remember that, well, I think I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a moment. Yeah, um, there, there, there is, a, there's, I'm going to say, there's a problem with that. We could also, under the universal jurisdiction statutes, possibly prosecute him in municipal courts. And then, of course, the International Criminal Court could take him pursuant to a Security Council referral, because Iran is not a member of the ICC. So Article 13 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court would be the only avenue through which he could be prosecuted by the ICC. With respect to ICJ jurisdiction, there are all kinds of potential problems. Iran is not likely to consent, and consent would be necessary. It's already thumbing its nose at the Security Council resolutions related to its nuclear program. It would take years for a decision. If you look at ICJ cases, they take forever to be litigated. And for all we know, Israel could be blown up by then. Um, and it, it deals with the liability of the state, not the individual. And the trend has been toward individual criminal responsibility. Municipal court jurisdiction, um, under the universal jurisdiction statute, is not likely because, frankly, I don't think we're going to find any countries that would be willing to prosecute. Um, and even if they were, it would be hard to get Ahmadinejad, and there would be claims of sovereign immunity. Um, they would cite to the Congo versus Belgium case of 2002, um, where it, it, under domestic jurisdiction, it would be difficult to get around sovereign immunity. Not true in the international criminal court. And so that leaves us with the International Criminal Court. Again, a Security Council resolution pursuant to Article 13 would be the only way to do it. But it would show that there is a, a world consensus through the Security Council, or at least a broad international consensus. Uh, and or, the, the position taken on Iran's nuclear program is already somewhat indicative of that. If Iran continues its shenanigans, if it continues to finance terrorism, if it continues to thumb its nose, and if it continues to play chicken the way it has, who knows? It's not likely, but um, that's the only way it could go. Because it's unlikely, my conclusion <coughs> is that we need to focus not on the reality of incitement the way it has already been prosecuted, but on the way it should be prosecuted, which is as a deterrence mechanism. That's what I argue in my paper. That's what I say is the key to making sure that we don't have genocides again, because if you look at genocide, it is always preceded by hate speech. And I will conclude, just give me 
one last bit of low light so they can see my last quote. With the quote of Hitler expert Ron Rosenbaum, it has never happened before this kind of preemptive indictment, but that doesn't mean it can't happen now or that it shouldn't happen now or that the international law making incitement a separate crime shouldn't be applied to Ahmadinejad and his genocidal incitement against the Jewish state. Considering the hideous historical record of failure in the past to prevent genocide, failure to pursue this course would itself be a crime. So, thank you for your time. Are take questions now for a few minutes and then uh, Professor Manashi. Jonathan? Yeah, I appreciate very much your, your comments and uh, it's extremely interesting. But I wonder whether the fact that he has not um, gone after the Jews in Iran, whether that doesn't actually show us something very significant, which is that it's not ethnic, it's not even religious. And I wonder whether at the root of the attack on Israel and the Israeli Jews isn't a larger global, a geopolitical struggle going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia, in fact. In that struggle, Israel stands in the way. In fact, Israel stands in the way between Syria and Jordan. And if you get rid of Israel, then you get rid of the only stabilizing state in the Middle East. And I, I'm just wondering whether there is not another uh, approach to this, which puts it in a larger context, so that simply um, eliminating Ahmadinejad does not in fact eliminate the problem, the eight <coughs> fight between the Sunnis and the Shiites. I have two observations. First of all, I think you can very well be right, but you have to remember, I'm focusing on criminal prosecution. Um, the question is, could, could a case be made out, and could we prove genocidal intent um, with respect to the law as it is. And my argument is that if you are advocating for removal of Israeli Jews from the Middle East, that whether or not you attack the Jews who are living under a dictatorship, if you will, within Iran, um, and are not being targeted for destruction currently, um, that that shows that there's not genocidal intent, I would, I would say to you that the, the Bosnian cases prove otherwise. The targeting of the uh, Bosnian Muslims in Srebrenica was only a limited part of the group. And yet that was found to be sufficient for genocide, proving genocidal intent. So I take that as far as it goes for purposes of criminal prosecution. As far as whether there are greater implications, geopolitical considerations that deal, deal with Ahmadinejad's reasons for wanting to get rid of Israel, you may be right. But I do think that there's, that there's some anti-Semitism in there. Um, if he felt warm and fuzzy about about Israeli Jews, I don't know that he would be so uh, concerned about you know whether or not he was having a struggle with Saudi Arabia <coughs> and that the that the Israelis were a problem in that regard. So I think it's complex. Uh, Mayor, I have two questions. Uh, can you prosecute the head of state for being for being responsible for what other people in Eastern, let's say the official media, which he controls? Me. That is, because I mean, you can find not only Ahmadinejad's face segments, but segments in the radio or TV which advocate the destruction of Israel or go much further than what Ahmadinejad said. So can you say that he's responsible for that, even though he himself not say This is one question. Secondly, or comment, the other question of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, I think there is ample evidence to show that even anti-Zionism is, is also very much interlinked or anti-Semitism. Anti just give you a few examples. Um, Remember, I agree with you. No, 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 no. just to, yeah. to enhance the point. I mean, not only that the Holocaust denial, but the Holocaust of Ezra Zion, which is officially an anti Semitic document long before Zionism, I mean, before Zionism was, existed, is used to explain, an anti Jewish document is used to explain Israel and vice versa. Or to give another example, Grand Ayatollah Nuri Muhammad Ali, two years ago, explained that when the Prophet Muhammad destroyed and massacred, the Jewish tribe of Banu Qurais in the 7th century, century, he destroyed a major Zionist base. Right. So, at that time, there was no distinction, supposedly, between Zionists and Jews. They were the same. You can have this also the same thing 
I point out in my article that, for example, on U.S. campuses, that there has been a demonstration of anti-Zionism uh, on, on campuses here in the United States that has been found to be the equivalent of anti-Semitism. I mean, you could, that argument is, I think, fairly solid. Um, uh, and and I, again, along with the Holocaust denial, which you're very aware of. Um, your second question is, I think, uh, an issue of what I would call superior responsibility. Um, that's another international criminal law doctrine that I've dealt with elsewhere, not in this paper. But possibly, if you could show that he was responsible for controlling the media, if you could make out a case of command or security responsibility, then yes, you might be able to show a lot of liability. Um, and that's what we found in the executive cases. The Nahimano media case, there was found to be superior responsibility. Those guys were just, they set up the radio and they were in charge of it, but the announcers were the ones who were making the statements. So, so that's possible, and I think, going back to your question, you say there are others, um, you know, why Ahmadinejad himself? I think Ahmadinejad has been extremely prominent and has made a lot of statements, and he's, he's the head, he's the titular head of, of the Iranian government. So I think this idea of the culture of impunity that I mentioned at the beginning, we have got to fight against that. We have got to root it out. There is no place for that in, in society, and I think prosecuting Ahmadinejad would send a, a very strong statement to the world in that regard. We have a lot of questions, so please, very brief questions. I have two points. Uh, first, uh, question. question. Yeah, question. Yeah. The first and basic yeah. question. Uh, he refers to regime, and very important. Doesn't it mean that the word right. regime comes all the time? Not all the time. Not all the time. No, but in, in, in relation to Zionism, in relation to... Uh, to Lots of the time. Yeah, I mean... Uh, the reason I say this is because I, the way they, they talk, I know very in detail in terms of how they see Israel. Uh, uh, I know it, the Persian and I know how it, how it works. Right. Uh, the two things, okay? One, there is no, there is no secret that the Islamic Republic wants Israel, but of the map, means, you know, disappear. Right. As simple as it is. But their position on Arab Israeli conflict very important is a one state solution and a referendum, which means they do accept the existence of the of the Jews in the land, except that they don't accept a state for the Jewish people versus a state for others. I'm just just official position of the Islamic Republic is is a one state. The question I have is is a little different. Is it possible? that Ahmadinejad is making this propaganda to redirect attention from his attempt to get closer to the Bush administration. And the reason I say this is because Ahmadinejad, from the moment he has come to power since now, has tried everything in his power to come closer okay, to the regime. Interesting question. Okay, okay. I, I, I think... That Is it possible? That I, I think that that's that's why it's important to look at the at the larger context. I mean, he might have he might have some mixed motives, but I think he has enough. And he's shown enough uh, of a motive, uh, if you will. I mean, I, I should speak more strictly in legal terms. He's shown enough of his intent, I think, uh, to, to be serious about genocide. That and especially in the connection of the violence that comes with the terrorism and the sponsorship of ter terrorism. I think that undercuts a lot of, of simply just saying, well, it's the official policy that, that this is the way it should be, when behind closed doors and under uh, you know, cover of darkness, uh, there is money and there is support and there is training being given to terrorist organizations that are attacking Israeli civilians. It doesn't, it doesn't cut. Yes? No, hold on, hold on. Yeah, um, I have uh, two questions. One, uh, in, in the Zionist movement, uh, makes the judicial, ex executive, and legislative powers um, under the control, put under the control of the spiritual leader, um, would Ahmadinejad be able to get away from his responsibility of on the media and his control of the media? The second question is um, Ahmadinejad being a true disciple of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and presenting himself as such, would the discourses and the hate speeches of Ayatollah Khomeini be useful as a president or as, you know, leading to this? 
I do, and I do talk about uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini somewhat in my paper, so I mean, I do think it helps put things in context. Uh, the statements of Rafsanjani, um, even Hatton, uh, indicate the kind of the depth of the hatred of Israel. I mean, this, there's a whole context, there's a whole poisonous environment that exists here. Um, your question, I think, is also related to uh, command responsibility or superior responsibility, and um, as well as the, the so-called defense of following orders. You know, possibly you could say, well, he's just uh, listening to, to Khamenei, telling him what to do, and therefore he might assert the defense of following orders. That is not recognized in international law. Um, and possibly Khamenei could have liability, but that would have to be proved. That would be an entirely different subject. So we have, we have three minutes. I'm going to take three, collect three questions. So one, Neil, and then Professor Gordon. Yes. Uh, if you set aside your prosecutorial hat, and if you were the defense attorney, what would uh, be the major <laughs> defense that you had on this case? All those issues I raised. I mean, all those. We're going to collect the question, and then you can answer as you please. OK. My, my question has to do with the um, um, some good consequences and some bad consequences. Good consequences seem to me that you could be indicting a lot of guys across the Middle East along similar lines, including Nasrallah and Hamas and, and probably dozens, maybe hundreds of others. But the bad consequences might be that it could be extended. The same principle of this sort of prosecution could then be extended with people indicting the United States and indicting everybody. Okay, got it. And the last point. Hasn't the Ahmadinejad gone beyond Israeli Jews and spoken about Jews in general when he refers to Jews as bacteria? So why are we uh, uh, splitting hairs here about Israeli Jews? He's gone to Jews in general. Okay, I'll take one at a time. As to the defenses, I would I would say the points that I brought up are the ones if I were representing them that I would bring up uh, at trial. You know, it's not clear who the audience is. You could make the argument that it would not be immediately grasped uh, if it were not Iranians, for example, because he's speaking in Farsi. I mean, there are a lot of things that you could say in that regard. Uh, you, could, you could try to show that the links between the terrorism and Ahmadinejad are not that great. I mean, there are a lot of things. Remember, reasonable doubt is the standard. All you have to do is raise a reasonable doubt. That's the highest uh, level of proof that a prosecutor uh, has or that anybody has in the law. So. I'm not saying it's an airtight case. I'm saying it's, it's possible, and it seems to me that there's probable cause. But as a defense attorney, I, I think I could, I could certainly have a credible show in court. Uh, as to the other uh, persons in the Middle East who are doing this sort of thing, um, yeah, I suppose. But you have to realize that every prosecutor has, has to make decisions regarding resources. There are lots of things that you could do. Uh, when I was with the Department of Justice prosecuting crimes domestically, we had certain initiatives. What we look at is deterrence value. And deterrence value is, is largely what drives your decisions that you make as a prosecutor. So I would say, given the context and given who Ahmadinejad is and the virulence of his comments, the great deterrence value that there would be would justify that choice. The third question is related to uh, he's talked to Jew, about Jews as bacteria. Uh, why are we splitting hairs? Um, actually, I think those comments were made about Israel. When he talked about it being a bacterium, he's talking about Israel. He's not talking about it necessarily Jews specifically. So that's why I'm saying he could maybe get around and say, well, that's not, I, I was talking about the regime. I was saying that the Zionist occupation re regime was like that. That said, there have been occasions when he's made comments that indicate that he specifically hates Jews. And I think the Holocaust denial is certainly corroborative of that. So um, that's a point well taken. So thank you very much. <laughs> OK, so David Menashe will give the final uh, keynote uh, talk. And I just want to say it was really an honor to work with Dr. Nashri and his colleagues from the Center of Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University. Without his input, this whole event would never have taken place. So we're grateful for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> so after this uh, long uh, 24 hours, uh, I think it would not be even serious to try and sum up uh, or wrap up even the discussion. I can only promise you what uh, Henry VIII promised each of his uh, six wives. I won't keep you long. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> very briefly, point, a few points that I wanted to make. Iran is a complex country. Iran is a country that uh, really it's very difficult to comprehend and understand. 
I must admit, for the last 35 years, I'm working only on this issue of Iran, Iran and history and Iran culture, Iran and society. And unfortunately, the more I study, the less I understand. They keep uh, surprising me with all the new tendencies within society. The bottom line is that there is no black and white. There are other, other colors in between the black and white. And there are, within the Iranian civil society, even within the administration, there are different tendencies. Not all people in Iran think alike, and not all the people of Iran speak alike. And we can see people, and I think that I personally, I think that I have a lot of respect for civil society in Iran. There are positive things developing in Iran that are really very encouraging for the future. I would say that the country that has women as the Iranians have, or youth and students as the Iranians have, has a, this country has a bright future. The problem is not with the people of Iran, the problem is with the ideology and politics that are in control today in Iran, and I think that is a source of uh, concern primarily for the people of Iran. That's a, Israel and the world aside, the main victims of this policy and harshness are the people of Iran themselves. The revolution was actually changed our attitude and, and, and perspective of Iran. This was such a huge development that changed our attitude. I can tell you in terms of Iranian studies or Middle Eastern studies, there was a revolution only in Iranian studies. 30 years ago, before the revolution, in seminars and conferences on the Middle East, there was almost nothing about Iran. The entirety was devoted to the, to the Arab world. Uh, and today, I was speaking with the people in the Summit Studies Association. One quarter of all the Middle East experts listed in the MESA, they, their main field of study is Iran. Not Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, take all the Middle East. One quarter are working on Iran. And it's a visual way to look at it. You go to the library and see what are the books, how many books have been published about Iran in the 60s and 70s, and how many books in the 70s and 80s. How many papers in the journals of Middle Eastern uh, history or society have been devoted to Iran before? And how many now? But it's the problem, is, this is not a problem, but the problem is that this also changed our attitude and focus on different aspects of Iranian life. Before the Islamic Revolution, you won't find many books dealing with Islam in Iran in the 60s and 70s. Most of the books were about modernization in Iran, migration in Iran, population in Iran, women in Iran, youth in Iran, students in Iran. The process of modernization, westernization, and change. After the Islamic Revolution, most of the books somehow deal with Islam, Shia Islam. And to the degree that equating Khomeini's revolution with Shiism, with Islam, and I think that a more careful uh, attitude should be employed. Now, even if you uh, having, having said that, uh, the revolution which somehow I think that makes it difficult to us to understand Iranian history helps us in different ways. Because after such a huge tsunami, after such a huge change in history, it's easy to look back and see what remained from the legacy of the monarchy. What remains solid after all this basic change and what has been wiped out and changed and removed. And if you take <coughs> this perspective, you will see the many, <coughs> many developments that were the results of the policy of the monarchy or the results of westernization in Iran remain very solid. Let me do one, the most important thing is nationalism, a Western concept penetrated into the Middle East and into Iran late in the 19th century. It became such a profound and powerful aspiration and ideology in the Middle East, including Iran. In each and every case, almost, there was a clash between ideology of the revolution and the national interest of the state, interest of the state won over ideology. They may be willing to pay higher price that you would think logical to preserve their ideological uh, purity, but all in all, when there was a clash, it doesn't mean that the revolutionary movement
wakes up in the morning and says, well, what can I do today against what I promised or against my ideology? No, they wake up in the morning, they want to do exactly what they promised. But when there is a clash between the interests, we see that interest win. Nationalism is one thing. Modern education, we spoke about education here. 150 years ago, there was a struggle, a cultural war in Iran against modern schooling system. When the Iranian revolution came to power, they did not even entertain the idea of resolving the new schools and going back to the maktab. They continued to teach uh, biology, physics, mathematics, and you know what? Even the language of the great Saturn. It's so absurd that on textbooks of each English uh, the, the book, there is also explanation why do we have to teach our children English? The fact that they have to explain it on the cover of each book, or at least it used to be in the early 80s, it's very meaningful. Well, they have no explanation. We need to export our ideology, so we need foreign languages. We need to fight with imperialism, so we need technology, and that for, therefore we need foreign languages. The Islamic regime has never been against Western technology. Western technology was a great service for Iranian revolutions. The telegraph line served the interests of the late 19th century movement, the early 20th century movement, as much as the video, uh, as the tape cassette served Ayatollah Khomeini, as much as I believe that the next trade in the Middle East would be a, supported by the Internet. All these issues that somehow that we discuss, but can you bring technology without culture? Can you isolate or separate culture from technology? The Iranians have tried to do it for a long time, and I think they failed again and again because big technology somehow penetrates also uh, uh, culture. In the morning today, we heard about uh, the basically different attitudes to the question of democracy, and I think that. Uh, the fact that Iran has elections should not be taken as a sign of democracy. In a way, Iranians have gone to the polls and voted in, in elections more than any other nations in contemporary history. On average, Iranians go to general elections once a year. Eight times to parliament, nine times to presidency, four times to uh, Council of Experts, uh, three times municipalities. I think we came to 29 years of the Islamic Revolution. We are not even discussing the run of uh, uh, elections. Well, is it a sign of democracy? But I think no, because the system is being controlled by the non-elected bodies of government which again we heard this morning, how much power they have in Iranian society. And here is the concept of Belaya Tefati. Many people are speaking there is be a change under President Bush. This is not the question. The question is, if there can be a change under the present administration, not in Washington, but in Tehran. As long as Khamenei is in power, when having so much power in hand, no one can really challenge it. On the top of it, let's not put ourselves, the Iranian regime is made up with smart, insured people. When I was doing a lecture in the military college in Israel, there was a banner on the wall translated from Hebrew. In Hebrew it says, You should conduct your wars cunningly. I think these banners have been removed to Tehran or to Qom. The other night I was speaking in New York in the opening of this session and I say that there are two main games that are very popular in and associated with Iran, uh, chase and backdoor. I think that the Iranians are playing with the word chase, planning their steps ahead of time, few phases ahead, while the West is playing backdoor throwing the dice and claim that everything will be okay. This was not supposed to be like that. It is time that the West will have a policy, a calculated policy, to tackle with the challenge of Iran. The conservatives are in power, and no matter how many nice women and freedom fighters we have in Iran, at the end of the day, the people who decide on issues of national security are not the reformists, certainly not when they are in jail. 
Iran who will push the button. They are the conservatives. For, for eight years, Iran, Iran had a, a reformist, a pro reform president, Khatami. At least for four years, they had a majority in parliament from 2000 to 2004 reformist. A combination of parliament and the president could not should do anything significant, even on the issue of attitude towards the United States, not to speak about attitude to Israel. What is the secret of the power of the conservatives? First, they speak in the name of God. Now, it's wonderful to wake up in the morning and tell the people what God exactly wants. We have some of them in Jerusalem, we have them in other places. Then there is a group of people that claim a direct link to the wisdom of God, and it's very influential and conservative like society. Then they have the army. If God is not enough, God forbid, it should be enough. But if it's not enough, you still have the revolutionary guard and the army and the intelligence. And then you have the will to fight for your power. The mentor of Ayatollah, uh, of, sorry, and the mentor of President Ahmadinejad, Ayatollah Mestah Yazdi, made it very clear when there were students rioting in Iran in July 99, on the Friday sermon, he said a sentence that I think that whoever respects Islam should be really scared of such sentences. He said that whoever thinks that Islam is a religion of mercy does not understand Islam at all. Islam orders us to take sharp sword and cut the heads of the people who are against us. This is the mentor, or supposed to be the mentor, of Ayatollah, uh, of, of President Ahmadinejad. We spoke a lot about anti-Semitism and uh, the challenges to Israel and to Western civilization. And honestly, for me, it really doesn't. I don't go to this question. It's wiped out of the map of page of history. The context is clear. The subtext is clear. The ideology of Imam Khomeini is clear. And the slogan of the Islamic Revolution, Israel should be eliminated and destroyed. Israel, Israel by Ahmad Awud Gaga. I asked a friend of my Iranian, why do you have to say that Israel should be eliminated and destroyed? After you eliminated Israel, what is the man to be destroyed? Just to make sure that it's dead and buried, you know, that they won't come back anytime. So this, there is no question about it. And it's really this wording of if you use A, B, or C, could not make a difference. And the, the, the distinction between Jews, Zionists, and Israelis, honestly, I can't read as an Israeli, as a Jew, as a Zionist. I don't see how one can, how an Iranian common person in the streets would be able to distinguish, what well, he is a Jew, but this is a Zionist. They call all American Jews Zionists. So if they are Zionists, why the Iranian Jews are not Zionists? And all of them are Zionists, because they pray to go back to Zion. They are Zionists. When they executed, the first civilian Iranians executed in 1979, uh, Habib al the head, former head of the Iranian community, was executed because of many things. But the headline was, a Jewish milliardaire has been executed. My friend, uh, Dr. Lindfeld, mentioned all, all these talks about the Zionists of the era of the Prophet Muhammad. Well, well the Zionists at that time. Unfortunately, there was no such ideology at that time. But they continue with this. I think that if Israel did not exist, Ahmadinejad should have founded the state of Israel because we serve an interest for the radical Islamist in power. Ideologically, they are against us. For pragmatic reasons, they don't have reason to change. And this hatred to the United States and Israel remain the main issues on the ideology of the Islamic Revolution. So why not continue and benefit? Unfortunately, for this wonderful city, Jerusalem, Whoever wants to be leader in the Muslim world would raise the flag of Jerusalem. And I remember the days of the early 80s when Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. His army was marching the opposite direction. And Saddam used to say that the way to Jerusalem goes to Tehran. We looked at the map. The army was going everywhere. <laughs> but the issue is the symbol of Jerusalem is unifying people behind you in the name of the struggle for the Islamic of Jewish or anti-Jewish codes. Let me end with the following uh, one, one major point. I'm a great believer in the people of God. 
My main uh, area of studies in Iranian history was about education and the young people of Iran. Iran can certainly be proud of the young people that it has. And the educational system is better than most of the countries in the Middle East. Women organizations are the most active. The cinema industry is one of the use of internet and the is the most extensive in Iran. There are many other things. The problem is not the people, the problem is the, 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 the ideology, the politician, and the, the government. Iran, yes, though, has a tradition of popular movement and uprisings that no other country in the Middle East has. In the last 130 years, years, there have been four great uprisings in Iran. One of them, the Tobacco Movement, 1891, 92. Then the Constitutional Revolution, 1906. Then the Mossadic Movement, 1951, Then this Islamic Revolution. Ultimately, I believe that the young people of Iran will start moving. The problem for someone like me, whose main field is history, is that historians are more careful than political scientists. Political scientists often make predictions. Historians don't make because they know that predictions are worthless. And I remember when my grandmother who was born in Iran, in Kashan, was very old and very disappointed of the young generation. She used to say that these days, even the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> the future has never been what it used to be, because the kid is looking for surprises. But ultimately, people, people start in Iran will start moving. Iran is the only country in the Middle East with the constitutional revolution. Iran is the only country in the Middle East which has two huge revolutions in the 20th century. The question is, how can we predict when people are start, start people will start moving? There is a beautiful song in Hebrew that says that All of a sudden, people wake up one morning and start moving. The problem is that we really don't know what would happen until people would wake up and start moving. I have a sense that this one day will happen. I can promise you no one exactly knows when, and no one exactly knows what should happen in order to start movement of the, of the young people of Iran, of the women of Iran. But I can promise you when this will happen, you will have many scientists, many academicians and politicians who say, we exactly knew when that will happen, when it will happen, don't trust them. In history, there is no way to know when people get tired from one <coughs> system of realities of life and they start moving ahead. In Iran, there is a tradition. In Iran, there is the potential. And the main potential is that the aim of the revolution has not been then materialized. The revolution, in my view, was not Islamic. The result of the revolution was the Islamic regime. People went to the revolution because they were fed up with the realities of life. They were looking for hope for their children, for the future. Khomeini promised them the hope, if you want the illusion, that will bring them to the, I almost say, to the promised land. This, after 30 years, did not happen. And the main challenge facing Iran itself is this gap between the expectation of people and the realities of life. I think that as long as these aims of the revolution, of the revolutionaries of the 70s, have not been fulfilled, the Islamic revolution has not been, is not yet over. The Iranian culture has been based for centuries on two major pillars, Islam and, and, and Persian culture. The tradition of Imam Hussein or Ali and the tradition of Cyrus the Great. And I think that in the last 200 years though, we can see that the Iranian culture is being based not on two pillars, but rather on three. Islam, Persian culture, and Western civilization. People ask if, if, if the West will penetrate into Iran. I can tell you, the West is already in Iran. They go to the streets and they chant the death to America, death to America. But when they are thirsty, they want to the, the Pepsi Cola, they to the, the, the Coke. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but they, they, but they, no, they like, they like the, 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 good, the, the real taste, as they say. So I think that there are changes in society, but to be a major change, uh, a lot of time is uh, needed. Thank you very much.
think of the line of people different uh, from the regime. The regime come and go, the people is safe. Uh, an American friend asked me, why is it that after 50 some years, Iranians have not forgotten the 53 coup? I said, well, I have bad news for you. Iranians have not, have not yet given up on Yazid, who came along Hussein 1400 years ago. <laughs> You're talking about 53 years. Now, Iranians are good people, but again, they are also the kind of people that they don't need to make them join in. It's only unfortunate, but they really are very deep in it. My concern is, at the end of the day, as our lawyer would say, that in every process there is a bottom line. In every case there is a bottom line. And the bottom line in the Israeli-Iranian relation is that these two nations have, at the end of the day, lived together. And that we cannot afford to make the two peoples into enemies. Because regimes come and go, governments come and go. At the end of the day, we must do everything in our power to create the kind of infrastructure needed to create positivism among the two people. Well, my, my real, yeah, yeah. My, my real uh, okay. question to you, or respect, I mean, what we all respect and do, and I'm proposing to you is, David, you have a very good position in the Iranian and the Israeli community. You could get good a tie, a break, tie break. It could be a good uh, mediator. It could be a, 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 a pretty good, good office. And create a kind of institution that brings some kind of a positive understanding to this relationship. As opposed to allowing people out there to just be negative. I think it is critical that we Iranians and Israelis okay, develop an infrastructure that will bring positive ideas among us. And I want you to please think about it. Well, uh, I, I agree with you to a large degree, except for your uh, somehow uh, belief that I can do something significant. Uh, <laughs> 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 the thing that you are right is that uh, there is no hatred about uh, peoples with the two, two sides. No, I have to humbly to admit it. Uh, admit it. And I, I, I think that uh, if Israel did not turn Iran into the enemy. When, the, when Imam Khomeini came to power, Israel did not ask its diplomats to get out of the country. And you know how much Israelis respect the life of its own people at least. And the fact that the Iran Israeli diplomats remained in Iran after Khomeini came to power <coughs> means that Israelis were even entertaining the idea to continue relations. I think relations between the two countries would serve the interests of the nations. Iranian Israelis, for some reason, still think that in, in, about Iran in the way that you mentioned, as a potential ally of Israel. Because Israelis think about Iran on two juncture in history. They remember Cyrus the Great and the freedom granted to the Jews to come back and build the temple. And they remember the last Shah, uh, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, that was nice to the Jews to the way that when I was in Iran, they called him uh, Papa Levi. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but in between them, in life, the Jews have really suffered. I think that it's all at the, at the hands of the Islamic revolution. The Islamic regime. If the Islamic regime would have worked, and, and, and I don't want to interfere with your elections, but again, I think that any of the candidates of the presidency would end up dealing with the Iranians. If the Iranians would ask them, they would, would agree. The key to the change is in Tehran. And unfortunately, as long as we have such a system that everything is in the control of the Belagali Fari, Ayatollah Janati make it very clearly. He said that even if 20 million people would go to one way and the Bali Fari would say something else, the work of the Bali Fari is the supreme leader, is the rule. As long as we have such a system and the checking balances are all check, checking everything in the favor of the conservatives. It's, I think, the main problem. Let me say another word. I think that what concerns me in terms of the Iranian domestic debate, and I agree with what has been said before, that we should encourage the Iranian asking questions and debating among themselves on many issues, including relations with Israel, including with, with, Iran, with our United States, nuclear issues. Start, let them start arguing. They, are, they know how to argue among themselves. That's what we do sometimes. So I think that this should should be should be encouraged. 
What I see in Iran recently is the spectrum of political debate has been significantly narrowed. Look about the, the elections of the first majlis. You had two dead communist party members running for office. You have Mujahideen Khalq running. You have the freedom movement, the national front, all kinds of movements that were part of the Islamic revolution. In the 90s, the contest became between reformists and conservatives. Today, the contest in Iran is between conservatives and neoconservatives, principalists of two major countries. So actually, the, the, the domestic debate has been narrowed in favor of the conservative, because today no one speaks about a challenge of the reform movement, although it may happen <coughs> one day, as I told you, I don't know the future. But currently, and what we see also, as we mentioned earlier in this, this morning, is that the Islamic regime is made up of shrewd people who draw conclusions from their mistake and correct their what the mistake that they identify. What they have done in the majlis elections to the eight majlis compared to the six majlis or to the eight majlis with the Council of Experts of December 2006 is one example. Okay, so we're actually, we have to leave it here because we're out of time. Just a, a couple of very brief announcements. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> After the Yale initiative on the interdisciplinary study of anti-Semitism, there's a lot of people to thank. Lauren is still outside organizing right. Charles is here. Should thank you too. <laughs> I really appreciate all the speakers who came from Miles and uh, you know, went to some trouble to get here. Thank you for coming. And the people who came to hear. Um, Aaron, a student intern from ESA, is also helping out with the camera. So a lot of people went, went out to make this uh, event I think a great success, so thank you. And also, just for uh, your information, tonight there's a very important person who was born in Iran, who's now the Deputy Prime Minister of Israel. He was in uh, Bufaz. He was in Washington today for strategic discussions with the uh, Bush administration, with Congressman Rice and other people. And he'll be here speaking about uh, Iran and Israeli-Iranian relations, uh, apropos of your question. He will be here at the Yale College, which is at 1 Prospect Street at 745. I think it'll be a very, it's a very important issue, as we all know, and it's a, a timely event. So everybody is welcome to that. Uh, it's open to the public. So I hope you can come. So again, thank you very much. And